It is generally assumed that Genesis 1 and 2 are about creation ex nihilo, but many will be surprised to find out it really isn't the focus of the first two chapters of the Bible. Rather, creation from pre-existing material is shown a lot more, whether that be from the animals coming from the ground, the Adam coming from the dust, or the woman coming from the man. Many have concluded this is some type of ancient science. Others point to evolution. And others think that there was a way deeper, more fundamental meaning. In this video, I'm going to give you guys some help on how to answer those difficult questions, what the implications are, as well as point out a really unexpected way we see God creating that I bet you haven't noticed before. Before we dive deep, I have some disclaimers, okay? One, I'm going to be talking about the possibility of evolution and creation ex nihilo being in Genesis. I think it is definitely possible that when the text says, in the beginning God created, it is referring to creation ex nihilo. I think there are mentions in Genesis and throughout the Bible that could be referencing creation ex nihilo. In reality, there are tons of philosophers and biblical scholars that think there is good scientific, philosophical, and biblical arguments for creation ex nihilo that are in the rest of the Bible and outside of it. The same goes the other way. If one thinks Genesis is about evolution or some other science, we should be able to look at the text without having to worry about evolution or creation ex nihilo being debunked because there are lots of arguments outside of Genesis which make lots of people conclude those things. The question for me isn't, did God create things out of nothing or evolution? Rather, the question in this case is, should we conclude that from the text of Genesis? So if I say something that makes you feel threatened, make sure to remind yourself that you don't have to go about changing your views on creation ex nihilo or evolution just based off of this video. Two, you guys really need to make sure you are subscribing and hitting the bell notifications. I'm getting some high profile people on the channel. We are talking about awesome stuff. I don't want you to miss out on what the Bible has to offer, so definitely subscribe. Okay, we are gonna talk about each of the times things are created in Genesis 1 and 2. Talk about possible options there are regarding that and how to interpret them as well as what the implications are. First, we have Genesis 1.1. There are three main options on how to interpret it. We have the first one, which is probably most popular among lay people. That would be that this is the first creation act. On the other hand, this is the least popular view among scholars for a number of reasons. You can check out my previous videos in the description to understand why. The most popular among Hebrew experts is when God began to create the heavens and the earth. The earth was dot dot dot. The second most popular among Hebrew experts is in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, which is similar to the first one, but is a summary statement. In other words, it's not actually part of the narrative. It's just summarizing what happens in the narrative. After this summary statement or whatever happens in Genesis 1-1, it mentions the land and waters. If we go with the second and the third options, Genesis doesn't tell us how water and land got there. Additionally, under the second and third options, Genesis 1-2 is therefore the condition of the world before day one starts. Most importantly, all three views give zero detail on how the heavens and the earth were created. All it says is that they were created. At this point in the narrative, without any other context, we don't know a ton about what that means. Let's talk about the word create, which is bara in Hebrew. It is used 55 times in the Hebrew Bible. It can possibly mean creation out of nothing, but there's no place that it's certain and possibly never used that way. More often, it's very obviously used of pre-existing material. For example, in Isaiah 54, 16, God says, See, it is I who created the blacksmith, who fans the coals into flame and forges a weapon fit for its work. And it is I who have created the destroyer to wreak havoc. In this passage, God isn't referring to some random act of creating a blacksmith out of nothing. Oftentimes, it isn't anything material at all when the word bara is used. It is used for function or to bring order. 
Psalms 51.10 says, Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. David isn't asking God to David isn't asking God to creation him out of nothing a heart. He's asking God to make him a better person. So when we look at Genesis 1.1, even if we conclude that it's supposed to be referring to the first act of creation and the story by God, there's nothing about the word create, bara, that implies it was creation out of nothing. In this case, what that means for us is Genesis 1.1 can be referring to creation out of nothing, but it doesn't have to. How we interpret Genesis 1.1 is therefore going to be determined by what the rest of the passage says about how things are created. If we see something outside of Genesis 1.1, whether that be in Genesis 1 or outside of Genesis 1.1 in general, that's talking about Genesis 1.1, well, then we can probably conclude Genesis 1.1 is about creation ex nihilo. So let's see what happens on the first day. Remember, if one thinks Genesis 1.1 should be translated as when God began to create the heavens and the earth, or if Genesis 1.1 is a summary statement, this means that day one is the first thing that God creates in the narrative. In day one, we see the creation of light. It says, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. Notice it doesn't tell us how it got there. It simply says, let there be. In Hebrew, the word is haya, to be, just describes the state of things. It goes into no detail on how the light got there, other than God said the words, let there be light. It could have been creation ex nihilo. It also could have been something like how a king decrees, let there be drinks, and the servants bring drinks. At this point, we have two possible mentions of creation ex nihilo with no descriptions of how either one happens. In day two, it says, and God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. Once again, it doesn't tell us how it got there, it does tell us how the waters got above and below, but Genesis 1-2 says there already was waters before day 2. So that's probably a good indication that's where the waters came from. Okay, day 3. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. So the waters are moved and then ground appears. Notice how it just says it appeared, not how it appeared. It does imply how it got there, though. It doesn't explicitly say it, but it might imply how it got there. In the ancient Near East, we have other creation accounts from Egypt where there was only water. The water was moved out of the way, and then land appears. It makes sense that these would be the same concepts because the Israelites would have been aware of Egyptian beliefs. Even if you think Genesis 1-1 was directly written by God or Adam, you could still say that the Egyptian beliefs were based off of Genesis 1, and therefore that still gives us good reason to think they had the same thing in mind. John Walton notes, the emergence of the primeval hillock in cosmology reflects the yearly reality of the fertile soil emerging in the aftermath of the inundation of the Nile. Thus, it is clear that the emergence of dry land is associated with the growing of food. Interestingly enough, there is an emergence of plants after the primeval hillock in the narrative of Genesis 1, which is just like what happens in Egyptian narratives. This provides evidence that this is what the text is describing. In summary, either we don't know how the land got there apart from God telling it to be there, or it got there from being under the waters the water's moving out of the way, and the land appearing. As previously mentioned, we see in the rest of day three, it says, Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Once again, it doesn't tell us how the original plants or seed got on the land, but it does say the land did it. One could say it is implied how it got there by plants reproducing through seed because it says, let the land produce vegetation, not let there be vegetation. Some might miss that God is actually telling the earth to create for him in verse 11. In verse 12, we see the plants and trees, which the land consists of, creating seeds and fruit. 
And this we see the opposite of God creating out of nothing, but rather God told the land to do the job of creating through natural processes. In day four, it says, God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky. It's getting a bit repetitive at this point. Once again, it doesn't tell us how they got there. Later it says, God made two great lights, the greater light to rule over the day and the lesser light to rule over the night. He made the stars also. God placed the lights in the expanse of the sky to shine on the earth. It says they were made and then placed in the sky. Once again, doesn't tell us how they were made. Okay, day five. God said, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. The NET Bible notes, the Hebrew text again uses a cognate construction, swarm with swarms, to emphasize the abundant fertility. The idea of the verb is one of swift movement and for, back and forth, literally swarming. This verb is used in Exodus 1-7 to describe the rapid growth of the Israelite population in bondage. Then in verse 21, God created the great sea creatures and every living and moving thing with which the waters swarmed according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. God saw that it was good. Then in verse 21, God created the great sea creatures and every living and moving thing with which the water swarmed, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind. God saw that it was good. This one's a little weird to me because it seemed in the previous verse to imply that the swarming of the, the things in the water was a way of God creating it or the the waters were creating it or something weird like that but then later it says that god created things in the waters so this is a little odd because it's like is the first part where a god actually creating something is nothing happening and then god creates something and the second part is it just referring to the same thing not terribly clear if you take these as basically the same thing it doesn't tell us how god created it God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the water in the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. Ronald Osborne notes, in Genesis 1.22, the text suggests an incomplete or still empty creation with ecological niches waiting to be filled by living creatures, by the animals themselves through procreative processes that will extend across time. The birds and creatures of the sea are commanded by God to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the waters in the sea and to multiply in the earth. The text does not restrict the multiplication of animals to quantitative multiplication alone. We are left entirely free to think that the creator might be delighted to see his creation multiply not only in number, but also in kind. God's way of creating is therefore organic dynamic, complex, and ongoing, rather than merely a sequence of staccato punctuation marks by verbal decree. One might come back at Dr. Osborne and say, it says God created according to its kind. As we already mentioned, it isn't clear how it was created, but that's beside the point. It never says how it's supposed to multiply after it was created. It also doesn't say it had to multiply according to its kind. It just says it was created according to its kind. One might say that it's assumed that it's multiplying by their kind, but that once again means it's ambiguous at best and not true at worst. Okay, five days of creation, and we don't see any explicit reference to creation ex nihilo. Surely we will see it in day six. Here we see God said, let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds cattle, creeping things, and wild animals, each according to its kind. It was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the cattle according to their kinds, and all the creatures that creep along the ground according to their kinds. God saw that it was good. It is interesting that it says, let the land produce living creatures, which seems to imply that the creatures came from the land. A really odd but possible way this could be read is like how... A mother produces a child. Super weird, but I guess theoretically it's possible. Then it says, God made the animals in verse 25. How does the land produce living creatures 
but God somehow also makes the animals. There's two options. Either the land and God are making the animals, or the land is producing the living creatures and God is getting the credit. Now that's really interesting. What's most interesting about this phrase is that it implies that the other times God is asaing could mean God isn't directly making it. He's not doing it, but he's still getting credit. Here's an interesting argument. This structure of let the language might refer to the locations of the origins. The text exploits of Ninurta says, let its meadows produce herbs for you. Let its slopes produce honey and wine for you. Let its hillsides grow cedars, cypress, juniper, and box for you. Let it make abundant for you ripe fruits as a garden. Let the mountains supply you richly with divine perfumes. Let the mountains, here it comes, let the mountains make wild animals team for you. Let the mountain increase the fecundity of quadrupeds for you. Walton notes, the role of the land or the mountains in producing animals does not give us material information as if this were some sort of spontaneous regeneration or a or a subtle indication of an evolutionary process. Rather, the land and mountains are locations of origin. This is where animal life comes from, not what it is produced from. I don't think we I don't think we should put a ton of weight into this line of thinking, although it is definitely worth mentioning. In addition, Walton notes how this thinking could have arose. He says since many animal births took place in sheltered places like dens, burrows, etc., the observations of the ancients indicated that the land brought forth the animals, you know, babies emerging from the ground. So is it referring to God or the land literally changing in matter so that animals or plants appear? Well, honestly, I'm not sure what to make of it. Okay, fine. Let's talk about day six. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image. Nearly all Christians think being in the image of God isn't a physical thing because that implies God has a physical body. If not physical, it is interesting that the only description for how humankind is made in Genesis 1 is a non-physical thing. God commands them to subdue and rule the land. It also says for them to be fruitful and multiply. Two more instances where God is using physical objects to get his goal accomplished. In Genesis 2, God makes the Adam from the Adama. In other words, Adam is created from the ground just like the animals are. Animals, again, are said to be made from the ground. Verse 219 says, The Lord God formed out of the ground every living animal of the field and every bird of the air. Ronald Osborne notes, some believers have thought that the idea that humans might be related to other animals detracts from their glory as creatures uniquely made in the image of God. Being related to soil hardly seems like a more noble distinction. Yet, the fact that humans share the same material origins as other animals is plainly stated in Genesis. After that, the man, Adam, the earthling, is told by God to avad and shamar the garden, which could be translated as work and keep, care and maintain, or guard it, which implies that there's still work to be done by the man. Genesis 2.21 says, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was asleep, he took part of the man's side and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the part he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Once again, not creation ex nihilo, woman was clearly from a pre-existing matter. Random fact, which will be important later, it also says why the woman was created, which was because the man needed help. This is another instance of how God is using his creation to do work for him. Let's summarize. Genesis 1-1 probably begins with the earth and water already there. Day 1 doesn't tell us how light got there. Day 2 doesn't tell us how the firmament got there. But it does tell us how we got the waters above and below. And we can be pretty confident it wasn't creation ex nihilo. Day 3 doesn't tell us how we got land. 
but implies it came from beneath the waters. It does tell us the plants came from the land. Day 4, once again, doesn't tell us how God made the sun, moon, and stars, but it does tell us he put them in the firmament. Day 5 tells us God created the flying creatures and animals that swim, once again, not telling us how they were created. In day 6, the animals on the earth were produced by the earth, whatever that means. And finally, humans are created to which it only says they were made in the image of God, which we know wasn't a physical attribute. Then we have Genesis 2. The earthling slash the dam is made from the dust of the earth. Animals are made from the ground and woman is made from man. In other words, we have zero instances of creation out of nothing being explicitly described and a whole bunch of mentions of creation from pre-existing material. Does this mean that Genesis 1 doesn't describe creation ex nihilo? No. Does it mean that creation ex nihilo didn't happen at all, even outside the text? No. It simply would mean that Genesis 1 didn't carry it up to mention it. Does this mean another part of the Bible can't give us further insight onto what happened in Genesis 1? No, of course it can't. At the same time, I think it's very important to ask why is creation from existing material the focus? So how have people attempted to explain this? Some have said it's describing evolution. I'd like to say it's unlikely as what we know of evolution today didn't exist as a belief in the time period. Advanced science would have confused them and frankly would be no use. Another way to look at it is the writer was describing creation through change of previous materials, which is an ancient view of science. They would say it wasn't right from a scientific perspective, but God accommodated to them just like he does in other places in the Bible. While I grant that it's possible, I don't think we can simply assume that they were concerned with their ancient scientific origins simply because it's a big deal to us. It seems unlikely that God would inspire them to write a text that would contain things unimportant to them. At the same time, we don't know with certainty that the scientific origin wasn't important to them. Other ancient creation texts in the same time period can go either way. Another explanation is to say where God says things happen, and it happens without, without any other details like let there be light, it's not saying anything because that's creation ex nihilo. It's not giving a description because you know, there's not really a way to describe it. Additionally, one can say if the writer found it important enough to describe the material process that happened in other verses, like when he said the plants came from the ground, he must have been implying it was creation ex nihilo and the ones where he doesn't describe how it happens, like in day one. If the writer wouldn't have been able to describe creation ex nihilo, if it was creation out of nothing, because there's nothing to describe, well, obviously they're not going to describe it. Quite frankly, it's not there and then it's there. So maybe that's that's just describing crazy next to Hilo. To which I would say that's an assumption. There are other perfectly plausible explanations of why it wasn't mentioned. For example, it's just as likely that God didn't find it important to mention how it happened from a scientific perspective, while the descriptions of how it happened were things he wanted people to focus on. An additional option is to say it was a mix of creation out of nothing, creation through chance or evolution, to which I would say it is possible but must be argued case by case. Finally, I'd like to argue what might be a new view to some, creation through change. In other words, the language of change conveyed the underlying truth that God is in control. One might call this a metaphor in today's world. But someone like John Walton and many other scholars would argue that things like splitting of chaotic waters would have conveyed something far greater instead of just some water moving around. John Walton notes, Deity pervaded the ancient world. Nothing happened independently of deity. The gods did not intervene because that would assume that there was a world of events outside of them that they could step into and out of. The Israelites along with everyone else in the ancient world, believed and said that every event was the act of a deity, that every plant that grew, every baby born, every drop of rain, and every climatic 
disaster was an act of God. No natural laws governed the cosmos. Deity ran the cosmos or was inherent in it. There were no miracles in the sense of events deviating from that which was natural. There were only signs of the deity's activity, sometimes favorable, sometimes not. The idea that deity got things running then just stood back or engaged himself elsewhere, you know, something like deism, would have been laughable in the ancient world because it was not even conceivable. I think this explanation fits really well with how we see the text. An obvious example of this is how on day six, the land brings forth animals, but then the text says God made them. In Genesis 1-2, it describes the chaotic waters where darkness and disorder exist. Light appears, which defeats the darkness and disorder every day. The chaotic waters are split on day two, which is often seen as the defeating of chaos in the Bible and ancient Near East. Some examples of this are in Isaiah 27, Psalm 74, Enuma Elish, and the ball cycle. On day three, the land comes out of water. It could have symbolized another splitting of water or God creating space for humans. This makes sense as land coming out of the water symbolize an opportunity for growth of plants for food and resources in Egyptian thought. Days one to three symbolize God making an environment on each day for days four to six to fill them. It symbolized order in the cosmos because God is putting things where they should be even if he didn't literally put them there. On day four, it explicitly says the sun, moon, and stars were placed there to establish order for the seasons and in their proper realm in the sky. Day five, animals located in air and water come from where they are supposed to and are called to reproduce, which implies potential for growth of life. On day six in Genesis two, the man and land animals come from the ground which could have meant the man and animals were mortal to the ancient Israelites. Of course, humans are made in the image of God, which isn't a physical thing to most exegetes. Instead, in some way, it signifies the purpose for humanity. Then we have woman who is taken from man's rib or side. In verse 24, it says, For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So they're taken apart. So you have so you have the man and you see you see that it's taken apart, whether that be a rib, a side, whatever. It's taken apart and then it's put back together, which very obviously which very obviously conveys a theological meaning of union. To summarize, what we have talked about today could be explained a number of ways through evolution, an ancient view of science, creation of nothing. It could be a figurative way in which writing conveyed a deeper meaning. It could be a mix of all of them. Anyways, I hope this has been helpful to you. I'd love to hear where I've gone wrong, and I hope you subscribe so you don't miss out on future topics. Anyways, thanks for watching.